And it is a great name. It causes demons to tremble. Amen? Yes. Give these guys another praise the Lord. Amen? They serve the Lord so faithfully week in, week out. Also, a big thank you to ladies and gentlemen that showed up for work day yesterday and got so much done in the parking lot, inside the building, outside the building. Let me give you a big hand for all the extra work you put in. Appreciate that very, very much. We do have a bulb coming for the projector, but it wouldn't get here before Saturday, so uh, it'll be here Tuesday, and we'll let somebody climb that scaffolding and fix it. All right, Frank? No. <laughs> Frank will find a volunteer, right? He loves to be high up with the Lord. Praise the Lord. We're in a new study in the book of Philippians today, which I'm extremely excited about. been looking forward to get to because I love this book. And uh, I have been reading and rereading and reading and rereading this book for about three or four months just in preparation of this study that we'll do together. <coughs> it's not, uh, if we were doing this on Wednesday night, it would take us about 16 to 18 weeks. But on Sunday morning, we'll do it about seven or eight, maybe nine. But because uh, what we're going to do with this study once we're finish each Sunday service within our small group ministries and our Bible study groups and lift groups. We're going to be studying it even further. So we're going to be getting a lot out of this book. It is a great book. I'm not going to do a lot of introductory to the book to just to share a few points this morning as far as uh, what the book is really all about. I've called the name of the series Extraordinary Living because that's exactly what we're getting into here in, in this letter uh, to the people of Philippi to this church. This was a unique group of people. Uh, this is what was the scripture we call one of the prison epistles, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and uh, there's a little a letter to Philemon. But those were all written in prison. And uh, this is unique from the other letters that were written in prison because uh, Paul's not dealing with a lot of, uh, having to correct a lot of doctrinal issues here. It's not a lot of corrective stuff like at Corinth and some of those things. This is a letter where it just, it's, it's, it's like a, a giant, I love you. It's like a great expression of love and appreciation for this church. Uh, like I say, there weren't a lot of doctrinal issues like, correct, like with the Galatians or to the, to, to the Corinthians. In fact, when you read the whole thing, you only see one little ripple of what might have been a problem in the fellowship having to do between two women who were having difficulty getting along about something. We, didn't, we don't have the details. He just has a corrective word for them. Amen. Well, I don't know. When you think about the Bible being the eternal word of God, I certainly wouldn't want my name written up like that. <laughs> All for everybody, for everyone to see. But Paul's coming to, to, the, to, to the end of his letter before he even deals with that. Because the whole letter is just this admonishment. It's just encouragement. And he's not even treating that issue as a big, serious issue. He's just telling them, hey, solve that problem. We'll, we'll talk about in the lift group some of the characters, some of the first members of the church when you get into the book of Acts and you start reading, you know, the, the introductory to all this letter later on where Paul's on his missionary journey in Acts and he's in Macedonia and particularly he's in Philippi, which is part of that region. Uh, he, he tells the story about how he got there. There's several people you see that get saved that are part of this of this missionary church. Remember, when Paul was uh, looking to go to Asia. The Lord appeared to him by vision and it was a it was a vision of a man standing in Macedonia saying, come over here, telling him to come that way. And Paul's heart and mind was to go east. God was him to go west and to go into that part of what would be Eastern Europe and Bulgaria today and that part around the Black Sea and Greece and all that area north of that. So he goes on the missionary journey. They're the, one of the first members, you know, uh, that comes to the church of Philippi is a woman by the name of Lydia. She's the first church member. Turns out to be that the young man standing in Macedonia saying, come over here, was a woman all the way. So he responds and, 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 uh, to the, the vision, and then the first person that led to the Lord is Lydia. And then there's some events that happen while he's there. One of them is this demonized girl gets saved. Uh, and so she's there. And then there's another church member and a family, basically, we see uh, from the story where Remember the story of the Philippian jailer? He, he's one of the first members of the church at Philippi. I mean, this Lydia and this demonized girl, this Philippian I mean, this is, this is quite an assortment of folks that are starting to make up the church. And it's kind of like Believer's Fellowship, you know? Some of you might not have been jailers, but you were in jail. So, <laughs> so there's just this, you know, demonized and problemized and issues and everybody from the commercial industry to the, to the jailer, I mean, is getting saved and, and these people are coming. We're going to talk about some of those people in, in Lyft today, but the idea is that 
it's amazing how the gospel can touch just so many people. And you can take a room like this, which is filled with so many different kinds of unique people, different backgrounds, different career settings, different places in, 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 the, in the world that we live in. And there can be such love and unity and sweetness of fellowship in the midst of all that. That's the grace of God. Only God can do that. Only the Holy Spirit of God can do that. Bring so many people from so many different backgrounds and so many different places in the culture we live in and unify them as one person. That's the power of God. That's the glory of the gospel. That we're all brought into the family of God. So if we get into this letter, we'll, we'll see some interesting things. But let me just kind of point out before I even start reading these passages is that one thing that keeps standing up to me about all this was, is the singleness of mind that you start really picking up on in the apostle's life. Uh, the, the book of Philippians probably has more what I call coffee table verses than any book in the Bible. You know, like for me to live as Christ, to die as gain. You know, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I mean, it's just a lot of those verses you see in a lot of devotional books. You see on little plaques and see on coffee tables. That's why I call them coffee table verses. So it's just chock full of, of good, good, just instruction, doctrine, and teaching from the Word of God. But it's, it just comes across through all of it. I, I keep seeing in Paul's mind is this singleness of purpose. I mean, he, he's got his mind on one thing, you know, and it's one thing only. And I, I will guarantee you in your spiritual Christian life, if we just get single-minded, you know, about the glory of God, the gospel of Christ, to live as Christ, to, you know, to exalt Christ with our body, with our life. It's amazing what God will do with people who can get their heart and mind focused on what's really important in their relationship with God. Amen? So let, let's look at some of these verses. And as we go through this passage, he, he says, Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi. Now, he wasn't talking to a special group of people in the church that we call them the saints, you know, like saint whoever. All the people are saved were the saints. So I'm writing this letter and then he says, uh, including the overseers and the deacons. And now, <clears throat> I think some people look at that and say, well, maybe they, they felt like all the instruction that's getting ready to come wasn't for them, it's for everybody else. No, it's for everybody. Or maybe, as some have read, uh, written and said, well, he's just making mention that the church is established, it has overseers and elders and pastors and deacons and all those things. Well, whatever it is, the message... And the letter is written to everybody. There's not, not a singling out here. He wants this word to go out there. He says, I thank, he says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now catch these words. I thank my God in all remembrances of you, always offering prayer with joy in every prayer for you all. I got to think about that. Has that ever been written about me? <laughs> Has that ever been written about you? Let me, let me make it a little more contemporary for you. When your phone rings and the message comes up and shows you who's calling, right? You know how smart smartphones I tell you who's calling? How many say, oh, praise God? Oh, so I'm not taking that. <laughs> that, that, that one will wait. <laughs> Trevor. I think Paul said, hey, when, when your ID comes up, I'm pumped. I'm excited. I think every, every time I think about you, you know, is it, or is it the other way? Every time somebody thinks about you, they think, oh, Lord, you know, what do they want? Or will they ever get it? Or, you know, so I think there's a lesson that, you know, and sometimes we just kind of read over these like they're just nice little, you know, sayings and little pats on the back. No, he, I, this, is, this is honest to hear because this just flows through the whole letter. Here is a group of people in a church that Paul really, really loves. And as, you, as we go through the letter, you'll get a little glimpse of why there's this great spirit of appreciation that flows from his heart for these people because you'll see there's, we'll mention in a couple of sermons down the road about Timothy and we'll talk about Aphrodite. Timothy was somebody that Paul was there in prison with Paul and he was sending them to the church of Philippi. And in the meantime, the church of Philippi took it upon themselves to send somebody to Paul. They sent somebody to him to, and while he's in prison. They sent one of their pastors to prison with Paul to go in there and minister to him, take care of his needs. And there was, this, there was this back and forth commitment and this back and forth love and this back and forth relationship. And, you, and you, Paul even says at one point where he's talking about my God shall supply that part, you know, all your needs. And he says, because you supplied my need. You guys, he said, we're the only ones who sent an offering to help. 
And so you see this appreciation, and you, and, you, and you see this love relationship that's going on. In the next verse, he says this. He says, always offering my prayer, joy in every prayer for you all, in view of your participation in the gospel from the very first day until now. You big guys have been on board ever since we started. I'm confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. For it is only right for me to feel this way about you. All of you, because I have you in my heart. Since both of my imprisonment, the defense and the confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers of God's grace with me. I mean, there's just a lot being said here about their commitment to him. And he's, he's expressing his confidence in what God's done in them. And we'll talk about the verse in just a little bit more. But he says, he goes on to say, listen, what verse are we in? Eight? <laughs> Catch up over here. He goes on to say, for God's my witness, how I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and to the praise of God. Now, I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. And my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else. And the most of the brethren, trusting the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from contention or envy, strife, but some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice, for I know that this shall turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that I shall not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness, Christ shall even now, as always, this is that singleness of mine, be exalted in my body, whether by my life or whether by my death. Anyway, however, the whole thing here is just to exalt Christ. Now, the first part of the book, and we'll deal with this a little bit more perhaps in our lift groups, but it just it, by the way of introduction, is his prayer and his encouragement. His prayer is obvious. He's talking about, you know, I... I when I pray for you, it brings me joy. When I pray for you, I'm excited about it. I, 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 I I'm enjoy praying for you, and I'm praying for you all the time. Verse 9, he says, I pray for you, and he talks about how I'm praying that your love will abound. I'm praying that you'll have real knowledge, and, and to the point that you're discerning in your actions that the, that the knowledge is being applied. It's not just head knowledge, but there's an application because you are practicing discernment. You're weighing things out according to the Word of God for your life. And as you do that, now you're able to approve the best things in life. Since you're walking with God, since you're walking in his word, you know how to make righteous decisions. You're learning how to make righteous choices. That leads to a life that's sincere and blameless. In fact, he goes on with encouragement, verses six through about 11. He just saying, listen, I, I am so clear that God is working. I have seen from the very beginning, I have this tremendous confidence that you are saved and you, just, you realize that it's so much so that I believe that this work that God has begun in you, he is going to perfect it. God's not going to give up on you. You have, you have made an obvious decision to give your life to God, to give your life to Christ. And because of that, you need to be assured of the fact that God has made a commitment to you. And God's not going to abandon you. God's going to stick with you. God's going to carry you through the worst of the worst, the best of the best because of this commitment. He which began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. That's exciting. That's hope for me. I, it should be hope for you because sometimes we get discouraged. Sometimes, you know, it, it gets difficult and discouragement and sometimes criticism that goes along with discouragement. I mean, it's like a disease. It infects a lot of people, doesn't it? But at the same time, Realize that encouragement has the ability to infect a lot of people in a good way. And that's exactly what he's doing here. He's just patting them on the back. I see God at work in you. Verse 6, God's going to complete what he began in you. Verse 8, I am an eyewitness of your love for God and your love for me. 
Now, we've covered a lot of turf there, which I would normally take several sermons to do. But I really wanted to get out to this context of what extraordinary life is available to you and I is not any different than the extraordinary life that was available to the Apostle Paul. God is no respecter of persons. What God does for one, he can and will do for the other in regard to his blessings and to his grace and to his gifts. Now, Paul goes into this after this great flowing blessing upon their life and encouragement of their life to just get down to, hey, okay, here's the way things are. And he speaks to them about several things. He, he begins to speak to them about, about his, the, the change. He begins to speak to them about his uh, circumstances. I'm hitting it. Nothing's happening back there. All right. Let's hit the next slide for me. He speaks to them about his, his change, his circumstance. He talks about his critics in this regard. And he talks about his conduct. Remember when the Apostle Paul, his, the Apostle Paul wanted to uh, go to Rome in the beginning. His mindset was this. I'm called to preach the gospel. I'm an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to Rome. And he writes to the Romans, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm looking forward to coming to Rome. And his mind was to go to Rome as a preacher, not a prisoner. You'll have to follow along because this gave up working for me if it's possible. He said, he's not going to go in the mindset he wanted to. I'm going as a preacher. Now he's going as a prisoner. It's not the way the expectation was. That's not what he was, he was, uh, don't, not what he was looking forward to to say. And that's the way we are a lot of times. We have something in our mind and we kind of sum it up. Okay, this is what God's going to do or this is what my expectation is. And then it doesn't go our way. And what we thought was going to be this great appointment becomes a disappointment. And this is where Paul's at. He said, these things which happened unto me in Philippians 1.12. All these things, that, and they knew exactly what he was talking about. They were there when he was arrested. He was in Philippi. You go back into the book of Acts around chapters 21 and read through chapter 28 and you'll see all that took place there with him. And this is, this is he could have written about a, long, a lot of experiences, but I believe most of them are familiar with. He's in the temple. He's finally arrested in Philippi. In, in, I mean, in, arrested in Jerusalem in the temple. They're aware of what's going on. He's told them before and now he's going in chains. He was arrested in the temple because he'd taken Timothy, I believe was the story in there. He, they didn't think he was a Gentile. Meanwhile, the Romans were on hand. They thought Paul was some kind of Egyptian renegade who was on their most wanted list. So they're grabbing him up. Thinking, and so he becomes the focal point of a religious deal going on and also a political thing going on. So there's a lot of plotting begins to take place. And now he's at the middle of it. He appeals in this process to go to Rome and stand before Caesar about his guilt or his innocence. And so he's, he's, he's put in chains. He finally gets the chance to head for Caesar, the privilege of every Roman citizen. And he gets on a boat headed for Rome. Now, he's been in Caesarea, by the way, waiting for this boat to take him to Rome for two years. All right. In bondage. Two years in prison. He gets on the boat finally under the security of Roman guards. They head out for sea. And they get shipwrecked. Isn't that the way it works? You know, it's just bad to worse. I'm getting stalled here. I have plans. I have things I need to do. And now I'm arrested. And now I'm arrested and held for two years. I can't even get to Rome for two years. And now I have a shipwreck. I mean, what more? Now I'm stuck. I told him not even to take the boat to start with. Acts 27 is a story about the controversy that went on there. Now, three months he waits on the island of Malta, finally embarking for Rome to stand with a trial that he had requested before Caesar. Most people would be sitting there just frustrated and fuming and stirring and upset. I mean, I, I can take this into consideration because this would probably be the way I'd be handling it. You know, this is, this is not what I planned. But the circumstances didn't become the issue. To many, a lot of people would look at Paul's situation as an absolute failure. But remember what we said at the beginning. Here was a man with a single mind, single mind concerned with one thing. I'm going to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't care what the circumstances are. My, my mind and my attitude is not have ideal circumstances. That's the attitude of most people. The mind and the attitude at this point is just single mindedness. I'm going to preach. He says in that verse, this thing that's happened to me has fallen out to the furtherance of the gospel. 
Everything I've experienced has brought one thing, which is my, what I'm all about anyway, the furtherance of the gospel. In fact, if you do a little study on this particular Greek word about furtherance, it is a word which really means a pioneer advance. This is, a, this is, pioneer, this is pioneering missions. This is pioneering advancement. Not what I thought, but it's what God designed. The Greeks used this particular term in, in their military. It referred to an army of engineers who would go out, kind of like the Army Corps of Engineers, who would go out into a battle region secretly surveying what they would need to do. I mean, this is all ground troops. They didn't have helicopters and planes. So they sent these guys in and they said, hey, here's how we're going to get across this river. How's we're going to traverse this problem. This problem is how we're going to get across this country. And they'd come back with all the plans and preset a strategy. This was called, you know, this, this was pioneer advancement. For Christians, it's where Paul is. That no matter what befalls me, no matter what the circumstances is, this is all for the furtherance of the gospel. I just need to be single-minded and stick with, you know, what I'm supposed to do. By the way, God still is in the business of arranging your circumstances and my circumstance to advance the gospel. So no matter where you're at, no matter what you're facing, no matter what the circumstance might be, it gets back to the same thing. The gospel originally came to Philippi because Paul had started to go into one area and God shut the other area down and said, you're going to go here instead. Paul wants to go east. God says, you're going west. So, okay, I'll go west. He takes his gospel. He gets back to Jerusalem. He gets arrested. But all these changes, no matter what, they, God's diverting these paths. And along the line, there are people who even tell him God's up to something. This vision that he has, God's showing him he's up to something. Now, I, I don't know where you are in the mindset of what you know about history and things like that and the culture and the world's gone by. But just think for a moment, what would have happened if Paul had taken the gospel to the east instead of the west? Well, you probably wouldn't be sitting here today. You know, and by the way, we call history his story. One of the beautiful things about heaven is not going to be sitting on the edge of a cloud with some kind of leer or whatever, strumming something. The beauty of heaven is going to be able to see the sovereignty of God in all that he's done through the ages. We're going to stand there and say, wow, what if that you knew all along? God's smart. You're not. I'm not. When it comes to God, I'm quite stupid, amen? When it comes to comparing, but God, and I think that's going to be the all of it all. Just, wow, incredible. Thank you, Jesus. I thought this was a bad deal. This was a great deal. I thought this was a wrong way to do it. It was the right way to do it. And we'll see in the glory of God, and the power of God, all that God was doing, you know, in, in his mind. God sometimes uses strange circumstances and strange situations to... Get down to what the apostle's saying here for the furtherance of the gospel, this pioneering of the gospel, this, this moving forward. And in Paul's case, and what he's relating to these people is, of all I've been through, and, and, and he talks about several things. The first thing he talks about is his chains, and he talks about several things after this. We're going to go through about three things here and, and speak about how each one of these were really just a, a tool to get Paul where he needed to be doing what God wanted him to do, not what it was in his own mind to do. And he talks to him about these different things. And he finds out these are tools. First of all, he says, because of Paul's chains, he's telling us that Christ was known. He said, I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. There it is. So that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else. And that most of the brethren, trusting the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Now here's Paul. He's chained up. By the way, they're not the chains like we talked about a few weeks ago, chains of bondage to sin. They're chains that are there due to persecution. Those that live godly in Christ Jesus are going to have to experience persecution, tribulation, difficulty. His chains were there on his hands and wrists and feet because of his commitment to Jesus Christ. The Bible says if we're going to live with him, it also means we're going to choose to suffer with him. We're living in a culture which doesn't really want to deal with that kind of issue at all. We don't want to talk about being in bondage for the cause of Christ. Paul doesn't look at it as bondage. He's not looking at it as, 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 in this regard. You and I, 
if we're going to really genuinely have this single-minded of purposes in our life, you better get it down. Not everybody's going to embrace you. Not everybody's going to love the idea that you love Jesus. Not everybody's going to be on fire and, and, and good with that. Some will mock, some will ridicule, some will seek to persecute you. Some will leave you. Some will, you know, forsake you. But you have to realize that this may be the very means by which God is doing a greater work in your life. I mean, God uses some, some strange deals. I mean, in, in Moses' situation, there was a rod. In Gideon's situation, there were pitchers they filled with light. And David had a sling. I mean, there's all kinds of things that just, in the context of the wisdom of man, don't make a lot of sense. Little did the Romans know or realize that when they put those chains on the Apostle Paul and affixed him to his wrist, they did not bind him. They released him with a whole new ministry. In fact, in fact, to begin with, you know, these chains gave Paul contact with lost people that he wouldn't have ever spoke to before. He says, he said, I, I have a now a word given to the whole Praetorian Guard. Now, if you know anything about Roman military, this Praetorian guard was the elite of the elite. All right. They're, Paul said, hey, I, I, I'm going to the top of the of the of this, the army food chain and getting to talk. To, these are the guys were sending out all over the world. If they get saved, the message goes out all the world like the Philippian jailer. His life has changed. His family gets saved. So he's not complaining about the chains. I mean, he's consecrated them to God. He's, he's given to the Lord and said, hey, use these for some kind of pioneer missionary advancement on whatever level you want to do. Now, well, here's the way that would work in, in the situation with Paul. During this part of the imprisonment, he'd be, he'd be chained to a soldier 24 hours a day. And the Romans, history teaches us that they would, they would have six hour shifts for prisoners they had to be chained to. So if Paul looks at 24 hours of being chained to a Roman soldier as four new guys a day to preach to. 24 hours, right? I got four new guys. Now, if you study the way they had had him in this house arrest and prison and security of these guards, they were, people could come in and see Paul. And Paul would daily be giving encouragement to the churches through people that would be sent there for him to talk to, daily be sending out letters, daily transcribing letters through Timothy or Aphrodite or somebody else who would be writing the things as he gave them to them. And the guards sitting there chained him all day long having to hear all this. Hearing about what God's doing. People come, oh, Paul, you wouldn't realize what God's doing in Ephesus. And they start telling the story what's happening. Because Paul later said, man, I'm so, I, Timothy told me about this and I'm excited about God. So they had to hear all these testimonies of grace. You know, he probably heard the story about, you know, the Philippian jailer. Everybody else. Every opportunity. These guys are getting it. I mean, they're just being loaded down. They say, hey, the whole Praetorian Guard's heard about me. Because you can be sure one guy go do, do duty for six hours. That's the last time I'm out with that guy. So a lot of guys are cycling through here in guard duty. A lot of guys are getting the opportunity to hear, to hear the truth. And, to, and to, as he said, it's for the furtherance of the gospel. So Paul's change connected him with a group of people, you know, it, it, that would never been reached. And these were guys who'd ultimately be going out all over the, the Roman Empire. Unique the way God works, is it not? But not only that, he says, also the officials in Caesar's court. Throughout the palace, the gospel's being preached. Throughout the palace, people are getting saved. God's doing a work here. In fact, he was in Rome really as an official prisoner and, and an important prisoner because when it all got down to it, the Romans were going to investigate his doctrine. Is this some weird cult? Is this something dangerous to the, to the empire? I mean, they're going to pour over this thing. They're going to have their little government leaders and officials pour over all the documents and all the records and the letters and what he's saying and hear what he has to say. I mean, can you imagine how, how blessed, you know, Paul had to be, you know, knowing that the court officials were having to come hear him out and study what he had to say. This is good news. But catch it, sometimes God has to put chains on us to get us to accomplish something unique, to take the gospel where it perhaps would not have gone, to put it in a, in a place that where it wouldn't have happened any other way. I, I can't tell you how many people have come to me over the years of ministry and said, you know, Pastor, I just feel so chained to my job. Don't raise your hand, your boss might be here. I just feel chained to this job. Well, that's not the way... He, the apostles saw it. I am here chained to this situation, but these chains are not bondage. They're freedom again to further the gospel right here and right now. 
My mother's here today, so you know, I got these kids. I used to feel chained to the house. I feel chained to these kids. You've heard people say that kind of stuff before, haven't you? I just feel chained. Maybe you're not seeing it from the gospel perspective. Maybe you're not seeing it from God's perspective. Maybe you're not realizing the ministry that is right there in your lap. It was it Susanna West had 19 kids? I think about chained. That's before they had disposable diapers. 19! No washing machines, no dishwashers, no dryers, none of all those conveniences of the modern culture we have. But out of those 19 kids came two preachers, John and Charles Wesley, who shook the British Isles and other parts of the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Six weeks of age, a little girl by the name of Fanny Crosby, blinded. Blinded as a child. Not able to see, but she determined not to be confined by the chains of darkness she became one of the greatest hymn writers history has known. She became a mighty force of ministry for the glory of God. Didn't see her bondage in that regard. Saw the freedom. Here's the secret. When you have the single mind, when your mind is singularly focused on God's will, then you begin to look upon your circumstances as God-given opportunities for the furtherance of the gospel for the glory of God. And you begin to rejoice at what God's doing instead of complaining about what God didn't do. Yes. And all too often, we find ourselves on the other end of that, complaining about what didn't happen. Complaining about what didn't come out. We had expectations. And Paul's changed, you know, here they give this opportunity to, to the Praetorian Guard, to the Palace of Caesar, and he says, even to believers. There's a ministry taking place to them. I mean, Many of the believers in Rome, he said, have taken courage that when they saw my faith in verse 14 to speak, they were much more bold to speak the word without fear. Just seeing what I was going through, it gave them boldness. And in fact, when he says speak the word, that's not the word in the Greek language for preach. It's the word for everyday conversation. They weren't afraid to bring up Jesus in any conversation. Oh, that's certainly been lost somewhere in the culture of the church today. We have swallowed hook, line, and sinker, the myth and the lie that talks about separation of church and state. We have been imposed upon us a doctrine or an ideology, a philosophy that states, hey, you're a Christian, that's good, keep it down at the church house, but don't bring it out here in the public arena. Well, you know where that comes from. That is spewed out by hell itself. Because if you are a Christian... According to what the Bible teaches, everything in your life is Christian. My job, my family, my kids, my way I vote all comes back to the Bible. The way I treat people comes back to the Word of God. So I can't hide away in a church that's where I do my Christianity. No, where we live our lives is in the world. We are the light of the world. We are the ones who give, give, give light. We're the ones who give life. We're the ones who give direction. We stand almost as a moral compass, at least we should, for a culture around us to show, here's true north. Nobody's heading that way for the most part, but we are. Yes, and we're not going to shut up. He said, listen, these people don't shut up. You can't stop them. Now they're bold. Why are they so bold? Because they've seen me go through what I went through. Discouragement, as I said a while ago, as a way of just spreading. And, and, but at the same time, what about boldness and your integrity to your faith and your commitment to Christ? It has a way of spreading as well. And people see the way you live your life. This is what the Apostle Paul is saying. Get single-minded. Live your life for the glory of God. See what God does. But the second thing he talked not just about how has chains created this thing, but he also says, my critics. I have critics. Philippians 15 through 18, some, some to be sure are preaching Christ even of contention or strife and envy, but some also of goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. And that's what he was there. He was in Rome to defend the gospel, all right? They know why I'm here. The former proclaim it out of selfish ambition. And by the way, the word ambition, King James says out of contention. And it is a word that literally means to canvas for office. Got a lot of that going on right now with the midterm elections going, people canvassing for office and saying, I'm for, you know, this and that. And that's why you should vote for me. And don't be for that guy and vote for me and don't vote for them. And this is what was going on. People saying, well, you know, are, are you for Paul? You know, are you for us? And Paul would just say, uh, neither. I'm for Jesus. You know, it's, it's not about, he said, but hey, at least they're preaching Jesus. 
whether it's out of sincerity or out of insincerity. Some preach it sincerely. They want to see people saved. Some preach it insincerely. They just want to make the situation difficult for me. I have critics, you know, envy and strife. Don't they go together like marriage couple? Just, but just like love and unity <laughs> can go together as well. So he uses this word, that, you know, <clears throat> that kind of shows that they're preaching Jesus, but their motives aren't right. But hey, but they're preaching Jesus. And maybe they just have to irritate me, but they're preaching Jesus. So it wasn't about whose side you were on and who were necessarily going to follow, you know. Now, there's a matter of historic record about two of the great preachers, one I mentioned a while ago, uh, being John Wesley. The other was George Whitfield. Lived and ministered at the same time. But boy, they were two ends of the doctrinal spectrum, miles and miles apart. Wesley, what we'd call Armenian, more, you know, the, you know in, in that camp. And then Whitfield over here in the camp of, of, of sovereignty of God and Calvinism. So there's really two big, big distinctions between them. But you never saw them with this kind of contentious thing for each other. In fact, it was asked John Wesley, you know, that it, it, somebody was interviewing him one day. Because <coughs> both were both preaching to thousands of people and seeing multitudes come to Christ. Somebody asked Wesley if he expected to see, you know, uh, George Whitfield in heaven. Because they had such differing opposing views on so many different areas. He said, no, I don't. He says, you don't? He said, no. He says, you don't think Whitfield's converted, saved man? Of course he's a converted man. But I don't expect to see him in heaven. Why not? Because he's going to be so close to the throne of God, I'm going to be so far away, I won't be able to see him. <laughs> he honored him. He respected him. They were brothers in Christ. They were both preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, criticism is hard to deal with. We, none of us like to deal with it. And it's hard to take it many times, especially if you're chained up, all right? Especially if you're in jail. It's almost like it, it vindicates those who would criticize you. Because they don't understand. You know, they, they see you in a bad state. Oh, well, that just showed God not on him. They didn't have any idea, did they? God was all over Paul. And we see the history of it today. But how is he able, in the middle of all that, with all these critics coming against him, just to continue to rejoice? Why? He possesses a single mind. The gospel is being preached. The gospel's being preached. The gospel. People are hearing the word of God. And he says, now in verse 19, this is just going to turn out for my salvation and my deliverance. And he says, and for the supply of the Holy Spirit. And the idea with the idea of the supplies is all that stuff, all the criticism, all that's going on. It's just going to be a blessing to me. In fact, he uses the word provision. I think it says in one translation, in American King James, I believe, says supply. It comes from our English word. The root of this word is what we get for, for a chorus, you know. Whenever the Greek city was going to put on a big festival, they didn't necessarily take it out of the budget for the city. They went and approached some benevolent person with lots of money. And this benevolent person would usually give this great donation. It had to be lavish. Uh, and, and the word came to mean having a, a lavish contribution. So where you get our word for chorus, by the way. And he said, all this is just going to provide all this criticism, all these chains. It's just going to provide this lavish contribution. You know, just a, there's going to be this outpouring of the Holy Spirit, he says, the spirit of Jesus Christ. So as I am in this situation, circumstance, hey, it's just a ministry. It's turned into a mission field. It's a pioneer advancement of the gospel. So whether I'm in change or whether it's the critics, we can praise the Lord because God's being glorified. The gospel's being preached. But let's be honest. That is so far from the average church member's mind that it's hard for them to hear this sermon and understand what I'm talking about. That we would live for the sake of the gospel. That I'd be on my job for the sake of the gospel. That I'd raise my kids for the sake of the gospel. That I'd be the person I am in my community for the sake of the gospel. That that's a driving force. But this is where he's getting to. How, how do, you want to live the extraordinary life? Because most preachers look at this passage of Philippians, oh, this book's all about joy. Well, there's a ton of joy in it. It's all about rejoicing, and there's a lot of rejoicing. But where's all that come from? You've got to get your purpose in life right. Did right. you live for Christ? And this is where he goes with the last thing. He says, I know that this shall turn out for my deliverance. And he talks about now his conduct. 
Because of Paul's conduct, Christ is magnified. He says, according to my earnest expectation and hope, I will not be put to shame in anything. Whether it's my critics, whether it's these chains, I'm not ashamed. I'm just going to declare boldly that Christ shall even now as always be exalted in my body, whether by my life or by my death. Sounds preachy, sounds beautiful, sounds spiritual. But remember, this is coming for a guy who's in chains, who's getting ready to go on trial, who could be found out to be a traitor to Rome and executed immediately. First trial, first hearing has gone favorably. The next one, there's no guarantee that's going to happen. Possibly he could be killed before the, before the year's out. But he's saying, it's just my body. And it's here for the glory of God. That by my body, if it's living, or if it's dying, and we'll see that when we get into next Sunday, we talked about for me lives Christ. He said, well, it, it, it just by my body, uh, it's, I have a body for a reason that Christ might be magnified. He wrote to the Romans, he said, the, the Lord is for your body and your body is for the Lord. He, he wrote in chapter 12, present your body, a living sacrifice. Why? Because it's here for the glory of God. You're a vessel. The Holy Spirit of God lives in your body. You're a vessel. Your body belongs to God. It's for the glory of God. It's to honor God. And what? He said that Christ may be exalted. And really the word here is not so much to lift up like exalt. It's a word that means to magnify, to bring out, to expose, to show the glory of God. This gets back to singleness of purpose, to magnify Christ in my body. Now think about that for a minute. How in the world can one mere human magnify Jesus? He can't get any bigger than he already is. Can he? He's just... Awesome. But here's what I can do. It's like if I want to look at the stars tonight and really look at them, get a good up close view of them, I'm going to have to get out a telescope. All right? And with a telescope, I can select one star, and the stronger, more powerful it is, the more I can see of it. The more intricacies I can see it, the more beauty I can see beholding it, the more I can enjoy it through this telescope. To the average person around us in the culture we live in today, Jesus isn't a very big deal. But there ain't a bigger deal in the world, nor in the cosmos, than he and his Father. But our body should be that telescope which gives people the capacity to get a clear, good view of just who Jesus is. Now, as the unsaved, people who don't know Christ, choose to watch my life and watch your life Especially as we go through crisis. He's in crisis, remember? There's a bad deal going on here for him. Especially as they see us in difficulty, they're going to be able to see Jesus much clearer than they've ever seen him before. It magnifies him and exalts him even greater. We can take the telescope and we can bring things closer, but let me give you another concept of making something bigger, magnifying. Let's take a tiny microbe, a bacteria, something very small, some some cell within the blood, what do we use there? We use a microscope to make it look much bigger so we can look clearly at it. We're living in a world where Jesus is not clear and nor is he big. But my life, my body is just committed to Christ Jesus and getting single-minded to serve Christ and to further with a missionary zeal the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, he begins to look much bigger. Other people, other things, far more important in the world that we're in. People are more occupied with those things. But as they watch you or me, especially go through a difficult time and a crisis in our life, then they get a picture of just there's something unique about them. They're not reacting as everybody else in the culture reacts when difficulty comes in their life. They're acting in a completely different way. And why are we reacting in a different way? Because we have this singleness of mind to bring God glory, whether by life or by death, that he might be exalted. And they begin to see just how big God really can be in somebody's life as they watch us walk through it. A body. It literally becomes a lens, doesn't it? It becomes a lens which people can get a, a, a picture of Christ. It might be little in their eyes. If I walk with Jesus, he's going to start being big in their eyes. He may be distant in their eyes, but if I walk with Jesus, he's going to start getting close in their eyes. Singleness of mind. Singleness of purpose. Furtherance of the gospel. 
for, it, you know, so he's saying here, it's my circumstances, they're opportunities. Well, we think our good circumstances are. People can see how much money I have, they'll see how big my God is. No, that's not what he's saying. The most difficult. My critics, hey, if Jesus is being preached, I praise the Lord for him. They'll keep main thing the main thing. We'll go for that. What about this situation with my conduct? This where he's saying Paul's conduct in the midst of all this was that thing that brought Jesus close up and visible to the world around him. So you get in this book of Philippians and you begin to see what we call an extraordinary living. Because again, that's not just for Paul. The grace of God that enabled him to see his life completely different than the way we normally would look at life is the same grace that's available to you and I should we get our heart, our heart and our life right with him. So quit whining. Amen? Quit complaining. Get, get the big picture. And the big picture is Jesus and his glory. Amen? Amen. Let's stand with our heads bowed. Praise the Lord, we get to baptize again today, amen? So we are rejoicing in that, and Sister Wanda Simon is coming uh, to make her decision public this morning. We're going to make sure she doesn't slip and get baptized ahead of time. Okay, you got one more step. You got it. Sister Wanda, why don't you give your testimony and give honor to the Lord at what, what he's done in your life. Okay, I'll be glad to. When I was seven years old, I walked the aisle and I asked Jesus into my heart and I was baptized when I was 10. But we moved to Houston when I was 12 and I was not in fellowship with, at church or anything until I was 35. So I really think I accepted Christ when I was about 39, but I don't want a thinking salvation. I want a knowing salvation. So. On August the 31st, I was in Zachary, Louisiana at a Bible conference, and the Lord had been dealing with me for a long time under Pastor Joe and Pastor Tim's um, preaching and ministry. And I just kept putting it off and putting it off and just saying, well, no, because I was saved when I was seven, so that was the real deal. And it really wasn't, because I never had the Lord of my life. And so on August 31st, I nailed it down, and then I came forward Sunday and talked with Brother Joe, and I know that the Lord is my Savior, and He walks with me every day. Amen. Well, Wanda, we're glad you shared that testimony, because we know there's others that may be struggling in that same area. That you have to walk past pride. Walk and, past pride and get yeah. that freedom. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, Wanda, it's my privilege this morning to baptize you, my sister. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.